Hello. I'm not sure. Uh, we got we lost our connection, everyone. So I'm really sorry about that. We um, we've moved. We've moved, but we're now standing in a hallway. So we shall find somewhere that we can continue to talk can to someone you. Someone let us know where. Uh, can anyone let us know whether they can still hear us? Oh, we probably lost your questions as well. Where shall we go, Naomi? Um, let's try to clear it. Let's see if we can find something. We're going to find a room where we can sit and continue our chat. Oh, hello again, Gem, and thank you for letting us know that you can see us. You're getting a little tour of the unit now. <laughs> we're down. We're here on level one. This is uh, antenatal clinic. outpatients. And uh, so we're, we're, we're going to try and pop into a room. <laughs> that was a that was a Carolina oh, yeah. photo bombing the live. Uh, the live session. There we go. We're going to see if we can talk to you in here. It's awfully dark in here. Oh, we got lights. Ah, and I'm hooked on the door. There we are. It's like a comedy show. There we go. So I'm really, really sorry about that. As was everything in, everything in our drop, we work on our Yeah, feet. we probably <laughs> So, I'm sorry. Um, there were lots of questions, and now the only problem is I think we might have lost. Um, lost we them, started so please, new... Yeah, please mm. come back and, and ask us your questions again. And then we'll start answering some of your questions. I'm sorry, we've looked because some of the questions we've lost, we can't uh, read them anymore. I'm sorry, I really do apologize about that. It's our technology. Um, what were we talking about? I can't remember? even remember what we're talking about. Skin <laughs> to skin, skin and skin. Oh, and somebody actually a baby. asked. Somebody asked uh, how soon, I think, I can't remember your name, I apologise. Uh, somebody asked how soon after birth, and maybe you missed that part. Um, so as Naomi said, uh, as soon as your baby's born, if you're both well, we, um, baby can come straight up um, onto your chest and, and be cuddled by you. Um, that's where your baby wants to be. You're, you've been your baby's um, natural environment for the last nine months and that's the only thing in the whole wide world your baby will smell and recognize when it's being born so it's the ideal while well, your baby's umbilical cord is still attached it's um, straight on to you if that's what you want and um, that's what we would um, hope for and then uh, let your baby rest and then your baby will probably start to bob its head like this head bob and maybe shake its head from side to side and all of that is actually your baby breast searching your baby may sort of wriggle itself down or up um, to be able to find the breast. Um, and, and this is called a breast crawl and all mammals do it. We like to think because we're humans and we have these big brains that we're somehow exempt, but actually your baby is a little mammal. And if it's kept with you after birth and you're skin to skin, your baby will play out its natural feeding behaviors, which is head bobbing and breast searching. And it's really cool because they have little tight fists like this and um, they have little pockets of amniotic fluid the the waters that they have surrounding them they hold them in their hands and they make little uh scent pathways up to your breast so that they can follow that smell um, to get to your breasts and you may also have noticed that your areola this dark or pink area has actually become much more pigmented much darker and this also we think helps baby as well as the smell helps baby um, locate your nipple after birth so as soon as possible as soon as your baby's interested and your skin to skin together to attach and have its first feed hopefully within the first hour um, and if your baby is a, either very sleepy or hasn't managed just done lots of learning but haven't, hasn't actually managed to attach that's still Wonderful, um, but just hand express a little bit into your baby's mouth um, or into a spoon or as we said before and um, to make sure that your baby gets some of that lovely um, colostrum in that first golden hour after birth. Um, so I hope that answers the question about how soon to breastfeed. We know your baby does nine things in that hour, in that golden hour and it cries and then it starts to crawl and it smells and tastes and it wakes up and it crawls and rests. And it familiarizes, which mm. Hannah's talked about with the smell and following the um, darkness of your areola. And it might have a little sleep, um, but it, and then it will suckle. And so you need to let your baby play out all of those things in the first hour in order to um, establish that first feed. And that's then imprinted. Mm. And we know that babies that have had a good feed in the first hour mm. have got an imprint, even if they mm. don't feed again easily they've got an imprint. So it's really important to let that baby play out those responses really early. And we also know that if your baby has done that in the first hour, that your supply will be 
more plentiful um, and uh, the impact of skin to skin and that first feed has a huge impact on what happens in the next little while. I know what we were talking about. We were talking about second night, weren't we? We were, oh, talking, well about, we were talking about <laughs> babies that grow yeah. born. Swimming. Can I just say something before I forget, which is when your baby, your um, name was talking about the nine things that mammals do when they're first born to be able to achieve feeding from their mother. And the important thing is that your baby will do quite a lot of activity and then it may rest. And it's having a rest and then it will start the activity again and it's often at the resting point where somebody may decide to help and actually it's really important to just allow your baby to rest on you and allow that time and then your baby will begin again um, the breast searching so um, sometimes people see that resting as the baby's given up or the baby needs a bit more help and actually the baby's just doing a very natural rest in that process and, and needs to be able to follow its own a rhythm where it will come back to more activity. So just what I've mentioned. Yeah, and the more times you disturb it, the more it goes back to the beginning. It has to go back to the beginning. And start again. again, and then they, they despair, and they mm -hmm. give up, and then they yeah. don't breastfeed. So uninterrupted, so you know, keep people away, mm -hmm. and um, protect your baby and and mum mm -hmm. with uh, you know the ability to have mm -hmm. that first feed, because it means so much to mother and baby in those early that early hour. Hello, Sarah. I think you're saying that was you. I'm hoping that that answered um, your your question about how soon to feed. So. so second night, we'll just briefly talk about that because that is the most challenging night for most um, families, uh, particularly if it's your first night home from hospital. You, you become very um, disempowered thinking that you haven't got enough milk for your baby and that your baby is feeding all the time. So it literally opens its eyes and grows horns at about eight o'clock and uh, they, they go away again at eight o'clock in the morning. So we know that that's what babies should be doing because your, your hormone levels are higher at night. Um, they, they like to be stimulated at night as well as during the day. And so um, allowing your baby to have that access, particularly in the early days, means that it's um, stimulating the milk production, it's protecting your milk supply, and it's asking your milk to be made. And these early feeds are calibrating for when your baby is older. So it's, you know, interrupting those feedings by saying, I don't have enough milk, my baby's not happy, I need to give it a bottle, um, means that you're interrupting that calibration and that the supply and the, the, the demand of your um, hormone levels will change if you interrupt that. So, you know, it is perfectly normal and healthy for a baby that is term and well and has no other problems um, to feed a lot on that second night. And we always say they're clever babies. I mean, they know it's hard yeah. and it's exhausting, but yeah. they're being really clever babies because what they're doing is they're agitating they're your breasts the milk. And, they're and, the milk. and they're trying to bring in that milk supply, yeah. which is exactly what their instinct is telling them to do. To and so the next day you have it asking. and they're jolly happy and then they start to gorge on day four because mm. they want more of the milk that they Which got. is why it's so important not to time and not to have, you know, that's why we would always recommend responsive breastfeeding. So looking like Naomi described so beautifully, looking at your baby's cues, those early cues and trying to respond to them because um, we, we don't want you to sort of watch the clock. We want you to watch your baby. That's a much, much more reliable feedback, your, what your baby's telling you. And your baby will, if it's allowed free and responsive access to the breast, will um, make will ensure that your body makes the right amount of milk for for your baby so that it's a it's an age old centuries tested um we have survived Guaranteed. as a species <laughs> because we're the most adaptable mammals on the planet partially because we carry and because we breastfeed and this has made us inc incredibly uh, adaptable mammals so that it's really a brilliant system and um, other mammals don't put their babies down for a long long time you know culturally we do we, we put them in a cot and the best practice is to have your baby next to you in the cot um, uh, or a crib. Um, but um, actually mammals are meant to carry their babies a lot. So having their babies mm -hmm. close and skin to skin is really important when you mm -hmm. can. And we know that also that breastfeeding mothers get more sleep than um, mothers that uh, bottle feed. Their babies are, are feeding um, and mums are able to rest more. It doesn't feel like it in the early days, but actually we know that mothers get more sleep if you breastfeed. Andrea is asking us, Naomi, whether she should avoid deodorant while breastfeeding. And I, I don't think 
avoiding deodorant as such, but maybe strong smelling perfumes and deodorants that might mask your natural scent because babies do, are very scent driven um, little animal, animals. They, they do like mum's scent and they can identify mum's scent very, very early on. They can also tell um, mum's milk over other milk. So we, we know that there have been some studies where babies can definitely identify their own mother, which is useful, maybe for uh, evolutionary um, thing. Um, so I wouldn't say avoid it, but if it's something that you've used and your baby will be used to your being in your body, then and that's fine. Maybe just avoiding strong, strong smells. Um, let's see what other questions we've got popping up, because I'm aware that we've lost some of your questions from before. Um, when we had to reconnect. Let's have a look if I can work the technology. Oh, oh here we go. Uh, Sarah, is combination feeding possible with breastfeeding? Um, um, so and, and thinking about maybe so particular situation, Sarah's um, saying that maybe not having the same amount of uh, lactiferous tissue on one side to the other. I mean, I suppose the first thing to say is that mothers of twins often only feed on one side. And we've also had um, mothers who have had to have a mastectomy, so a breast removed, and they fed absolutely beautifully on one side and fully made um, enough uh, for some milk supply for their baby. So that's completely possible. And um, so in, in, in and of itself, it shouldn't mean if you're only using one breast that, um, that you need to combination feed. Um, some some families choose to to feed uh, to mix what they call mix feed their babies so to give some formula as well um, we know that by introducing formula to your baby it introduces some health risks to your baby which is why there's such a drive to try and support mothers who want to to breastfeed um, because we know that breastfeed there are no benefits to breastfeeding breastfeeding is the physiological normal way that humans feed babies your baby is born expecting to breastfeed and um and it, and so it's normal there are no added benefits and people often say oh well um the benefits of breastfeeding are but actually there, there aren't any that's the health that all babies should enjoy um or should expect so it's um if if families choose to introduce formula either because that's a choice or because they have to then um, it's always about supporting families to decide for them as an individual family what the risks and benefit balance is. And we, we do that continually as parents all the time. We, we decide whether we're going to sit our little uh, toddler on the counter while we put the kettle on and we decide whether we're going to, you know, so we're continually making these risk benefits and it's uh, unavoidable as parents. So as midwives and as the infant feeding team, we're here to support you to make those decisions and we, we don't take responsibility for those decisions. We support you with as much information as we can to make those decisions. Um, we know that babies, that, so going back, maybe trying to go back to the question that was asked, which is um, about mixed feeding. We know that um, uh, babies who um, are receiving some breast milk can break down their formula that they're receiving and, and make better use of it because of the enzymes of breast milk. So um, certainly breastfeeding as much as you're willing or able to do is very beneficial for your little one. Um, so I hope that answers that. And I think also looking at why you've chosen to supplement, and that might be your personal choice, and that's absolutely fine. There are no rules in parenting. You make the rules as you mm -hmm. go along. Um, but uh, I think early on, if you've decided that you want to supplement because you don't think you've got enough milk or you don't feel that your baby's feeding enough or um, the baby's not gaining enough weight. I think, you know, some of the things that we really look at and teach parents in the early days is the four reliable signs of milk That's transfer. That's a really important thing that we were hoping to cover. So yeah, really so I think, you know, that you need to be looking them. at the first one, which is how your baby is suckling and swallowing. And you've got to hear visibly, you know, every suckle or every other suckle after your milk's come in. Uh, and certainly even when you've got just colostrum, your baby will be swallowing and suckling, but you will hear audible glugging and swallowing and that baby will do um, deep glug. So you'll find a pattern of little suckles followed by deep sucks when the pattern comes deep sucks and swallowing, deep sucks and swallowing, and then your baby will pause and then go back to deep sucks and swallowing. And the noise that you're listening for is almost, it's like a soft sound. And that's your baby, that's your baby actually swallowing the milk. So that's a really good, reliable way of knowing that your baby's transferring milk, hearing that sort of soft swallow sound. 
them. So that's really, if you're in a quiet room, if you have two or three toddlers running around or uh, you're in a noisy environment, you might not hear it so well. But if you're in a quiet room, you should be able to hear baby. You see so lovely big full cheeks, lots of movement on the jaw. And, um, you know, your baby's engaged with you. It's got its eyes open when it first starts to feed and it starts to swallow and perk up when it's getting food. It's like, oh, this is nice, I like this. And you'll hear that suckling and swallowing. And then the next reliable sign that you're looking for is that your baby's got wet nappies. And so um, certainly by five days, when your milk will be in, hopefully, um, your baby will do five or six peas a day and it'll be, you know, a tablespoon of water and a nappy weight. So if you're not sure, put some water in a nappy and feel it and see if that's what your baby's doing. And if it isn't, then you need to call your midwife. Um, and certainly building up to that between day naught and day five, each day your baby should do more peas. So you might get a one or two on day naught, day one, and then two on day two, and then you know three or four on day four, and then day five, you should then start to get much more frequent nappies. And you shouldn't have any sort of brick dust in the nappies, the, what we call urets, which are the sort of pinky, crystals um, after about day four. So if you find that you've got that, you need to be talking to a midwife, your baby might be a bit dehydrated. So um, lots of wet nappies. And then of course, then we see the change in poo and, and baby should go from the dark brown meconium color to, and it, this is in the off to a best start, you've got a little poo chart. Yeah, so the yellow leaflet that you're given after birth, I know that you will get so. loads of bits of paper, but actually from an infant feeding point of view, everything is in here. Um, and it is quite comprehensive. Yeah, so it's a, it shows you exactly here the colour change. So at first your baby will have green, sticky, black, almost tar looking, what we call meconium, which is the very first poo and is actually already in your baby's bowel, in your belly right now. Um, and then over the days as it starts to get to colostrum and milk, it will start to change to brown. And then this is the wonderful bright yellow um, breastfed Poo that we look for which is a bright yellow poos and that's what that tells us that the milk is going through your baby system which is very reassuring. And a bit seedy and that should be by day four so if, and baby should poo two pound coin size poo every day till they're about four to six weeks old. They at least twice. At least twice hours. yeah and if your baby's not pooing so if it doesn't poo on day three call your midwife and just say my baby hasn't pooed um, and might need some help with some breastfeeding just to make sure mm -hmm. So your baby, if it's coming, if it's going in, it will come out. Mm -hmm. And those first three signs, the first three, so that's suckling, swallowing, peeing and pooing, are very reliable. And so you almost don't need a pair of scales to tell you whether which your is baby the is, one. which is the fourth one. And it's one, a bit of a retrospective weight. thing. It tells you us know? what's been going on, whereas the poos and pees tell us what's happening now. Um, and the suckling button. So, you know, be tuned into what your baby needs. And the other thing you, you must, must realise is that after day naught, your baby's volumes go up. Well, if you're hand expressing and giving your baby food, the volumes will need to go up. And so um, as your milk supply increases, which is um, the nature's way of increasing food for your baby, your milk comes in and then your baby gets more fluids, you need to increase your baby's food every day. You shouldn't be waiting for somebody to tell you that your baby needs more food. So if you, they told you to that half a mil of colostrum was fine on day naught, you need to start to increase those volumes every day until your baby um, can breastfeed and you've got plenty of milk and or um, you're expressing milk and giving your baby um, milk to um, have. And the other thing that is really important to say is that you shouldn't be giving your baby mature milk or formula in a syringe after um, at any time. It should only be colostrum in a syringe and then after that you um, would either need to cup feed or if you've got someone who can support you to finger feed or um, a bottle feed, uh, if that's your choice, to give your baby enough food if you cannot give your baby uh, food at the breast. You need to increase those volumes every day until you're sure that your baby is doing those four reliable signs. And you as parents take that responsibility to look at your baby every day and is it doing the right thing yeah. and finding help. Because although it may not feel like it in the early days, you are the expert in your own baby because mm. you spend, you've had that baby with you and growing and, and, and learning about your baby. And, and then you've taken that really important journey through birth together and spent 24 hours a day together, even if you're only on day three or 
day five, you've spent far more time with your baby than any of the professionals that you'll meet. And although it's important to be supported by all of us, you are your baby's parents and you are the expert in that child and you know them best and you'll have a very important thing, which is a parent's instinct. So it's really mm. important that if you do feel concerned about your baby, that you do make sure that people listen to your mm. concerns and that's really important. Yeah, would you know say your that. baby more than anyone else, yeah. absolutely. We've got a few questions. So Amy, hello Amy, you've asked um, how often does a newborn need to feed um, and that you'll do your baby in June, that's wonderful. And um, if they're sleeping, should I wake them up? So, um, well, babies do feed often, um, not necessarily regularly. So babies don't feed, sleep for three hours, feed. I mean, it'd be very convenient in some ways if they did, but that's certainly not what babies do. They they breastfeed um, much more sporadically and, um, and chaotically than that. And that's very normal. It's important to surprise the breast. So um, we, as we said, we'd hope that your baby has that first feed within the first hour or they have a little bit of colostrum that you're able to express either into their mouth or into another receptacle for them. But hopefully they will latch. And so often um, what we see as midwives is that um, after that initial golden hour where they're incredibly alert and, and awake after birth, they often go to sleep. They have a really big, long sleep, mm, don't they, mm. for sometimes four to six hours. Parents do worry that their baby's not feeding. Um, and I think it's, a, we don't know, but we think it's probably a sort of birth they're recovering. It's a very hard journey being born and, um, and you're tired, but they're also extremely tired um, from that uh, big event. And so we do find that's why it's so important to catch that beautiful, alert, awake baby in that first hour or two after birth and, um, and, and maximise that because your baby probably will just conk out for a few hours. And that's definitely a pattern. That and if you're, you know, if you're worried that your baby is having big sleep, then use that time to do some kind of expression yeah. and you can give your baby some expressed colostrum mm -hmm. in between. So, you know, you've got a win win. Your baby's yeah. getting calories, even though it's a bit sleepy and tiny drops of colostrum in its mouth, you know, it will cope with and it'll coat the tongue and swallow it quite mm -hmm. safely. Um, but also you will prime your breast uh, prolactin receptors in your breasts to make the milk early and quickly. So don't think that you can leave your baby, you can leave your baby for a lot, but you know, a little bit longer in that first um, day. But, you know, use that opportunity to hand express and be ahead of your baby so you've got and little bits to give it. Probably the longest time that you'll go yeah. then not feed it because we say never, you know, never leave your breasts that long. Um, so, you know, you really, most mothers are feeding every two to three hours. Babies feed eight to 12 times plus breastfed babies mm -hmm. um, in 24 hours. And that's really normal. So as Naomi said, um, the best thing probably, Amy, is if you, if you follow your baby's feeding cues, then you won't go wrong. Your baby will tell you when it's time to feed. If you, if you think your baby's sleeping more than, after that initial sleep, then you think your baby's sleeping more than three or four hours, then maybe wake your baby, encourage your baby to have some skin to skin and to feed. But if your baby's healthy in term and, and otherwise alert when it's awake, then it's not something we worry about as long as you're responsibly feeding um, and your baby will lead the way. So sometimes babies will sleep and then they'll cluster feed in the evening so they may agitate you and go on and off and on and off and on and off the breast having these short little feeds and that can be quite normal often in the evening time sort of 6 p.m mm. onwards so um, that can be normal they can have periods where they feed far more and then periods where they feed less and you'll you'll start there's no real we would never recommend any fixed routine but what you'll start to see is a gentle sort of rhythm starting to emerge over the first couple of weeks so you'll you'll see that your your own baby has its own sort of rhythm and that's that's uh, that's as much routine as probably you you can expect from a breastfed baby and, and if your baby's gaining weight appropriately then yes you don't need to wake it necessarily mm -hmm. and it probably will wake you but um if your baby isn't gaining as much weight then you might be advise not to let the baby keep go too long if the if the weight is a little bit of a problem in the early days. So um, no, don't wake a sleeping baby unless we're worried about yeah, it. Yeah, unless you've been asked to do that yeah. because, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think we have, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, so I do apologise if I'm not saying it correctly, Naomi, Naomi. She's asked um, that we put the links and the names of the groups in the comments and we'll certainly uh, endeavour to do that um, but please also um, we will do that we don't know our IT skills will be up to it but we will <laughs> certainly attempt that and if not 
please go to our web page, uh, the um, maternity infant feeding web page, um, or a lot of the hospital. links are on there. Yeah. Um, let me just see who else have we got. We've all got, probably got bored and gone off and had a cup of tea or something by now. Let's have a look. Uh, who else have we got? Um, Tegan. Hi, Tegan. You're asking about removing jewellery and piercings. Well, I mean, if you've got a pierced nipple, you may want to remove the nipple ring or stud because just it may be more comfortable and you don't want to lose it inside your baby. But we don't have any reason to believe that if you have a pierced uh, nipple that it would, you know, it doesn't cause any uh, problems with breastfeeding. Sometimes what we find is, so I should have probably mentioned when I was teaching you how to hand express that this tip of your nipple here, there's not one single hole. I know this sounds weird, but you'll be surprised how many women do not know this. There are many holes. It's like a watering can and your milk will come out of the watering can holes. Um, so it's not just one hole. And uh, yeah, I know I've rocked some people's boats. And so, <laughs> So what you might find if your nipple's pierced is that you get milk coming out of the piercing and that's okay, don't worry about it. Um, piercings other places, um, it's fine. I mean, long as they're comfortable, they're not infected and with your changing, growing um, pregnant body, they're not becoming uncomfortable, then we, there's not a reason to remove them um, at all. I hope that, that uh, answers your question. Gemma, you've asked if you're planning to breastfeed, is there a restriction of pain relief post-birth? Um, no, we have uh, many drugs. There's very, there's very few medicines that you can't take when you're breastfeeding. So I think if um, you've been prescribed something in the hospital, then um, it's considered that it's fine to take it. So most people will take something like paracetamol, like ibuprofen, some mothers might need a little bit more, but even if you've had a cesarean and you've got um, morphine, you can still uh, breastfeed your babies. So um, you will not be prescribed anything that's not recommended for breastfeeding. And as I say, there's very few drugs that you can't have when you're actually breastfeeding. Yeah. So make sure you're comfortable because breastfeeding really is actually important. a wonderful filter and generally it, it's very good at protecting your baby. That's the next um, one. Um, can you breastfeed Sorry, we're before you? We're peering we're at the comments. We're both of a certain age and we can't read. So, um, <laughs> can you feed? This is Yvonne. Can you feed your baby before delivery? Well, many women um, do tandem breastfeed and um, they breastfeed another baby. Some mothers are breastfeeding two babies before they have um, or three, or three <laughs> babies. So, they may be tandem feeding lots of babies and that's all perfectly. Ah, um, uh, can you feed before you deliver your placenta? Oh, that's the question. That Sorry, we were going off because we're, we're, we were going off on a tandem. Yes, you can, and it will help to deliver your placenta. Yeah, so do, absolutely. absolutely. So, like we said, baby, hopefully everything will be well and, and brought straight up onto you. Um, if you're feeling uh, well and you're squatting, you may just, uh, the midwife may encourage you to bring your own baby up to you, and that's wonderful. So, you know, really having as little space between you and your baby at all times as possible. Um, and, and you'll still be, your baby will still be attached to its placenta. Um, by its umbilical cord, uh, and and if your baby shows that it's it's not too stunned and it's ready to have a suckle, then that's wonderful. And, and if your placenta takes a little bit of time, like Naomi said, it will the hormones of um, suckling at the breast will encourage the the little contractions that still continue to push your placenta out. So your midwife may even suggest um, putting your baby to the breast to, yeah, to, to, to help along the, the placenta. Of the placenta. So yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, as soon as you, a, you know, if it's been a bit slow, they may well suggest. Um, I think that uh, Sophie's asking um, if your partners are only allowed in for an hour. I think it's two hours, isn't it? Post delivery, I, it's continuously sure. changing at the moment. We're yeah. all just trying to. Um, so I, I'm sure that nobody will um, uh, ask your partner to leave before he's had a cuddle. No, I think that um, you know, in that hour. Uh, that that um, that will be precious time, and it and I don't think anybody will um, ask him to leave before he's had a cuddle of the baby. Mm -hmm. um, Jennifer's uh, asking about the golden hour. Um, 
is it worth mum keeping hold of the baby rather than passing to dad? Well, yes, please. We, <laughs> we would encourage you to do that. It's your birth, it's your family and it's your baby. Um, and every relationship is different. So every mother or woman person's relationship is different with their partner. But from a physiological point of view, from a, a breastfeeding point of view, um, we would strongly recommend that you consider um, keeping your baby on you, with you, as close to you as possible, exploring your, your breasts and your body and playing out. This is a picture, this is the nine, uh, this is the nine stages that we were talking about that all